Welcome back to It's Your Law. I'm George Curtis, and Judge Paul Riley is my guest today, and we're talking about an exhaustive campaign. And, of course, campaigns today are expensive. Most of us were appalled at the hundreds of thousands of dollars that were thrown in the most recent Supreme Court races and the special interest groups that got involved and looked to us like we were back in the state of Illinois where <laughs> we were right. bidding on uh, uh, judicial jobs. Now, I hope that's not happening in the race for the Court of Appeals, but uh, from what I've been reading, you've got an opponent that's put about 200 grand of her own money uh, to run for a job that only pays $136,000. That makes me a little uncomfortable. Uh, from what I've read, uh, you don't intend to spend more than 10% of the annual salary yourself, but then how do you compete? By doing things like this and getting out to rotaries, to meeting the people as much as I can. Um, but that's tr part of the problem in these judicial races, and especially in the Supreme Court races where they are pouring hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars into the races. We don't see that at all in the uh, Court of Appeals races, and it's simply because it's not a policy-making court. It's there to correct any errors. And so from my perspective, how I go about raising money is mainly through friends and supporters from Waukesha, as well as, uh, frankly, lawyers from across the state on both sides of the aisle, and I've been very proud to have received support from uh, many, many lawyers, judges throughout the state who have seen my work, uh, who know what type of judge I am, how I run my trial court, and, uh, but it's correct. We're going to spend a fraction of the money that my opponent is going to spend, and I have two girls in college, so I'm not about to cut them off either, so some things are more important than others. Well, uh, this might be a good time to ask. You have been very successful and gotten a lot of positive recognition for being an able trial judge. What is the attraction to the Court of Appeals? Part of the attraction was I clerked for the Court of Appeals when I was in law school back in 1985, I believe it was, and some people say you become a hermit when you go to the Court of Appeals because you're just reviewing the cases that already happened. Um, but as in any system, the tougher cases kind of winnow up the alley. And I enjoy the research, I enjoy writing, I enjoy the intellectual aspect of the job. And there are some great people through the years in District 2, and two of them are still there. And it actually is more of a collegial group on the Court of Appeals than it is on the trial court level. I love my job. I have the best of both worlds in this situation because uh, no matter what happens, I'm going to still be a judge. And, uh, but I really do love the civil work, and more than half of our cases that end up in the Court of Appeals are civil-related cases. And when you spend three years in criminal court, two or three years in family court, you've kind of seen all the legal issues pretty early on. And then you're handling the repeat drunk drivers and uh, that sort of thing. And while it's very interesting and it's, and it's humbling to see what people go through, uh, I enjoy the intellectual challenge. Well, you have a reputation of being a scholar. And of course, you wouldn't have gotten the job of clerking for the Court of Appeals while you were still in law school if you weren't a scholar. And I suppose the appellate work is a lot more scholarship. And with your background, uh, the primary job, which is to correct errors, the Court of Appeals is an error-correcting court. That's a perfect place to have somebody who loves scholarship at the same time has had broad experience. And I know you're receiving support uh, from district attorneys, from sheriffs, uh, from people who sue insurance companies, from people who defend insurance companies, and so that you've earned some respect across the board. And I suppose that's the message you're taking to the people in District 2 when you're trying to get this election. You, you're stressing differences from yourself and your opponent. I am, and I, I don't think there's any greater compliment to a trial court judge than to have the lawyers on both sides of a very hard-fought case both support you. And they aren't coming back to me. I'm in family court now. But they tell me they appreciated that 
I followed what I believe to be the number one job of a trial court judge is this is the people's day in court. Number one, it's oftentimes the most intimidating, scary day that they may ever have. And right or wrong in their position, they want to be heard. And I have two post-it notes on my computer screen that looks right back at me. One says, be nice, and one says, let them talk. And because it's, it is their day in court. And that goes for the lawyers, too. And sometimes you have to bite your lip to, to be nice. Well, well, you just brought out the two main reasons I'll never be a judge. Because, <laughs> because I, I don't think I could sit there and shut up. <laughs> so I, it's hard some days. I'm sure it's very hard to do. But uh, you, you recognize very wisely that this is probably the scariest day in the life of most people. They've looked forward to having somebody hear them and hear their story. And if they can get a judge or a jury or both to hear them, that's more important than the result in most cases, don't you think? I, I do, and, and one of the greatest teachings I had early on in my career was a police chief in New Berlin that I represented. It was ex-military man, and he actually ran a school down in uh, Chicago that taught high-impact close combat training, people shooting pistols at each other within two or three feet, mostly training police forces and secret service but he would bring the city attorney, the chaplain for the city down to uh, partake. And what he did is he would film it and then you'd go back and you'd describe what happened. And it's very, very high impact. You're shooting glass-filled water bullets and you have nightmares about it for a couple weeks after you go through the scenario. But what it also showed to me is that you will oftentimes in a traumatic situation, a car accident, a victim of a crime, you will often do the right thing, but your mind won't tell you exactly what happened. And so two very reasonable people who went through the same traumatic effect can have two completely different descriptions of what happened. And it, it always has reminded me that it doesn't mean someone's lying. It means that's how they perceive the incident. And that's the beauty of the jury system is to have 12 people from all walks of life be able to look at the two people who have been through a traumatic event or three people, or just the one person, and try and play it through based upon the objective facts that also exist. And do you agree with me that jury usually gets it right, but even if the jury didn't get it right, the litigants have had their say, which is what a democracy is about. We aren't entitled to win all the time. No, and, and I agree, and I, I frankly have not found a jury verdict that I've disagreed with in the seven years on the bench. and. Sad for my own purpose to say, one of the very early teachings I had was a week-long jury trial I had, and it was a contract claim, and both sides had claims against the other, and the jury came back with their verdict, and they said, you get nothing, and you get nothing, both sides get nothing, and at the bottom they put, you guys deserved each other. <laughs> and when you sat back a couple weeks later, you said, you know what, they were right. Yeah, and, if you think about it long enough, you can you, see why they came to that conclusion. And, and that's the beauty of it. It's 12 yeah. people who come from all walks of life, don't know each other, and they have to come to a decision, and it's not the government. Judge, we're going to have to take our second break, and when we come back, I'm going to give you a chance to tell the people why, first of all, they ought to vote, and secondly, why they ought to vote for Paul Riley. Thank you. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm. 